today is the topic of discussion is of course what has happened because of covid first thing covid is a pandemic which people say is a once in a lifetime event it is true but it was predicted at mr buffett has uh, mr gates predicted it it is the tiktok is very much available and the people took it casually and the authorities took it casually they thought such an event will not happen in living memory in 1914 to 1918 it was, there was a case of a spanish flu which went across the country across the world it did come to india and um, millions died in india also one of the reasons why the war end the first great war ended quickly was also the influence of the spanish flu but this time the world with, with better communication better science and better technology it bounced back very quickly and in about 2 years we got most of the world vaccinated we could have done it faster i am sure next time we will do better mr gates has written a book on the next pandemic which he says is definitely coming and what are the steps that are required to avoid such a catastrophe again it provides for an interesting read and it also lays out a road map on what authorities across the world must do to avoid such a pandemic okay having said this let us look at what has happened to india the indian gdp numbers are misleading because what happens is there are consequent revisions over the next several years so we will not know what is the exact impact of the covid on our gdp for another 3 4 years see it is because our economy is largely dependent on the informal economy nearly 75 to 80% of our economy is the informal economy so the we do not know the magnitude and the impact at of it this covid had on it our gdp numbers are extrapolation of what is there in the formal sector and that formula can be tweaked to anybody's satisfaction so i take this number that the economy declined only by 8 and a half to 9% and to some estimates by 10% with a huge bag of salt the impact around me especially in tamil nadu where which is a largely msme and sme driven economy must much larger having said that assuming that the government is right and it is only between 8 and a half to 10% the point is we have not yet recovered enough the last year much to the boast that we are the fastest growing economy in the world we would have grown at around about 8% if you fall if the gdp was 100 and it fell to 190 or 92 and you grew by 8% that means you had not even reached the pre pandemic level when the last next year of the impact was over it is only in this fiscal year that we are at a stage where we are going to cross the pandemic level or uh, pre pandemic level in to, in fact of gdp numbers aided a lot by runaway inflation accounting for inflation we may be just still at the same level which we were before the pre pandemic there are several indicators which show that this is the truth we will discuss that as we go by one of the most shocking things that happened is the per capita income of india fell the fell below that of bangladesh it meant that bangladesh handled this crisis much better than what we could do the recovery has been very lopsided the rich people like me have recovered faster the haves have recovered faster because we already had hard assets and we had access to finance we had access to markets and even before the economy could fully recover the stock market soared people who had investments in stock markets people who were already invested in bond and gold really prospered in this period because for they were sitting at home and they were making money one sector that was completely exempted was the it sector where the work from home was possible but large sections of our society especially in private education institutions media and hospitality have borne the brunt of what happened over two years tourism completely died let's take a town which is very close to where you live tanjavur followed by kumbakonam which completely depends on tourism for survival i'm sure 
after two vacations we are waiting for this vacation season which has just begun to recoup some of the losses so there have been economies that have been completely sections of our economy which have completely been destroyed in this period why do i say this is like a k shaped recovery if you take two wheeler sales as a proxy for our growth even today our two wheeler sales are somewhere not at even pre pandemic level are at somewhere between 2013 2014 levels and the year just before the after the pandemic we had reached 2010 2000 levels whether it is a 100 cc motorcycle or a gearless scooter there has the sales have not gone up this sales includes electric vehicles which have become pretty popular these days therefore it clearly shows the lack of buying power in bharat where there is a rural divide rural india and tier 2 tier 3 india towns have really faced the brunt because that is where two wheeler and four wheeler sales took place in four wheelers there is an interesting trend the trend is high end vehicles have sold much better have sold faster the audis the mercedes benz have done extraordinarily well well entry level cars of maruti have done extremely bad it's not that maruti has been replaced by another brand all brands have except the tatas who have relaunched and made from started from a new base very low base have reported abysmal numbers this is because there is absolutely no demand in the in what i call bharat also there is no way banks and final financial institutions which have been badly hit on recoveries during this period have unable are unwilling to lend to the riskier side of the middle class and the lower middle class and hence sales is badly affected as i have been discussing with you small and medium industry has enterprises have got really badly hit the msme sector is badly hit so you being based in trichy would be knowing what is happening in bhcl and also the ancillary sector around bhcl in tuvakudi which is where i was yesterday and which which showed me how badly it was what was once a thriving industrial estate is not any more very active this is not of only in trichy i went to hosur about a week back hosur reports the same problem if i go to western tamil nadu and talk to the textile manufacturer garment manufacturers and textile manufacturers in coimbatore karur or tirupur i face the same i ask i am i am told the same issue what is the difference in the way the west took on this crisis and the way where did we fail the west gave a lot of direct stimulus they transferred money to the poor they transferred money to the middle class they gave salary support and up to anybody up to a middle class level was given monetary support this enabled them to recover from the from the covid much faster small and medium enterprises were given support to pay salaries they were given easy loans they were given grants easy loans meaning no no interest loans especially in the restaurant sector and tourism sector canada took a more innovative approach they subsidized rent where the landlord was expected to take a 25% cut the small and medium enterprise paid 25% of its rent and the state agreed to reimburse 50% of the rent and salaries were subsidized in fact rajiv bajaj who runs a big bike making operation in austria said the austrian government subsidized more than 50% of the salary that he paid to his employees in europe this is the kind of support that europe america and some countries in asia gave i have repeatedly argued in several television debates that we have 175000 crores could have been easily spared by this union government to give a subsidy of 6000 rupees for a family to the bottom 
25 percent of our population. Had the government gone ahead and done this, our economy would have definitely recovered faster and much better than what we are today. Most of the support that went to SME and SME was in terms of guaranteed loans, loans that are meant to be paid back. These loans do have a high interest rate. Today, the world is in a grip of an inflationary spiral. This means interest rates will go up. Already, the Reserve Bank has increased interest rate by 40 basis points, that is 0.4. And the day before, the Honorable Reserve Bank Governor has said that there is going to be a series of rate hikes. I, experts estimate there will be another 2 to 2.5 percent increase in interest rates. This will mean that interest rates which were 4 percent will soon be between 6.5 to 7 percent. How does it affect you? The housing loan rates that your parents had at 6 percent will go to 9 percent. Cars and motorcycles will become more costly. But more than that, those companies which took emergency loans, what was given by the central government, will have to pay higher interest rates as the interest rates go up. The business has not yet fully recovered, but they were expected to pay higher and higher interest rates. This will sink more and more medium and small scale industry. One must understand that in a country like India or any country, it's the small and medium enterprise which provides more than 70% of employment. Unemployment is a huge problem in India and not more than unemployment, it is underemployment that is a big problem. That is, people are not going to be employed to their full potential. There was a great talk about the Startup India program, but as the world has begun to tighten, you would have been noticed seeing in the press that a lot of startups have laid off people. In fact, in the month of May alone, 8,100 startup jobs have vanished. And worse is still to come. In places like Tirupur, where the high input costs of cotton is making life difficult and people are unable to produce and export. Much of this inflation is imported. Because fuel, in spite of the toll claims made, of more than 85% of the fuel requirement of this country is imported. Even though we have the fourth largest reserves of coal in the world, most of the coal we use is imported because we don't have capacity to mine the coal that we may have. Also, edible oil, we don't produce enough protein that is dal and we don't enough pro pro produce enough edible oil which we consume and this also has to be imported so plus gold so a combination of crude oil crude oil palm and the cooking oil dal and gold has brought inflation inside india the rupee has been overvalued for a long period of time making our exports uncom uncompetitive but rising inflation in America means that interest rates in the developed world have started to go up. America has increased interest rates twice by 0.75%. England has increased interest rates. So has other developed countries. And therefore, currency, currencies across the world have started to fall. In fact, if you are following global trades, the yen is trading at nearly 130 yen to a dollar and is at a decade low when compared against the US dollar. The Chinese yuan is falling because China has no inflation problem and has started a rate cycle cut. In fact, the Chinese central bank has cut interest rate by 1.15% which has made the yuan weaker and Chinese exports more attractive. So India is caught in a bind where it needs to cut, you know, allow the rupee to fall, but a falling rupee will mean higher interest rates because 
inflation will go up. The RBI, in its own wisdom, is following a counter-cyclical policy of selling dollars. In the last two months, more than $50 billion have been sold to defend the rupee. What does this mean for us? If you have higher interest rates, definitely economic activity will come down because interest rates act as a, gravita a gravitational force against excess, against profits and against general economic activity. It is because the government did not collect enough revenues. It has been forced to borrow more than what it has to and therefore more money has been chasing lesser goods and services in our system. We have a very highly inflationary position today. The wholesale price index has been higher than in double digits for more than 13 months. So we cannot blame the base effect. For 13 months in a row, inflation has been in double digit. This means interest rates will go up. One direct fallout of that is that the already struggling real estate market, construction industry will suffer. And this is very pertinent because construction represents, construction workers represents the second largest unorganized workers in India after agriculture. Agriculture should be very happy at this time. In spite of rising fertilizer prices and rising pesticide prices, global food prices have been in a tear. On the Chicago exchange, the wheat is trading at more than 60, higher by 60%. Our farmers began to export wheat. Till America, India, the, our own government went on to say, we will become, we will become suppliers to the world. And uh, delegations were sent to Turkey and Egypt where Indian wheat was supposed to be sold. As the price of wheat started to rise in our market and farmers started selling to traders who were exporting, the government in a knee-jerk reaction banned exports of wheat. Thus, I am at a loss to understand if fertilizer prices are being raised, if pesticide prices are being raised, why is the farmer denied an opportunity to get higher prices for once in a blue moon? There is no economic logic. The price of sugar has also shot up and therefore the government has banned Exports of sugar yesterday night, the prices of sugar stocks have dropped today morning. But all this will not solve the problem because unless you bring down the excess liquidity in the system, inflation is not going to come down. And like I said, there is a K-shaped recovery. The farmer is not expected to export wheat, but large companies are allowed to buy Russian crude oil in the open market at 50% discount. An oil which is selling at 115 barrels, $115 a barrel, is allowed to be purchased at $50, $55 a barrel. The refining takes place in India and the diesel is sold in the open market at extraordinarily high profits. This company in question has reported a profit of 16,200 crores nearly in 90 days. This means 170 crores a day of profit windfall profits. If corporates can make such windfall profits, why can't our farmers make such windfall profits? This is indeed a question which policy makers should answer but will not answer. The other reason for a K-shaped recovery is the fact that we have cut our corporate taxes from 40% to 25% before the pandemic. The rich like me pay lesser taxes, whereas GST on all goods have been increasing. An ethical and a moral government is one which reduces regressive indirect taxes and increases progressive taxation. This government has done the reverse. It has cut pro indirect direct taxes and increased indirect taxes. You will know about the taxes of fuel that this government levied. This, all these has led to a K-shaped recovery. The idea of the government was that the rich would invest the excess capital. But unless there is demand, the rich are not going to invest their money in business, in building new factories. They are already paying off their debt. 
they are also making sure that they buy luxury toys for themselves. Suppose let me mythically run a biscuit factory. If there, I can have a factory which is making 100 tons of biscuit and I don't have demand for 100 tons, I'm making only 80 tons. Just because you have, you have lowered the taxes for me, why will I put up another biscuit factory when there is no demand? One has to, anybody who has a basic understanding of Keynesian economics must work to stimulate demand and that is what is needed. This government in a misguided policy has cut taxes hoping to drive investment. But no investment will come in an economy if there is a demand shock. India is undergoing a demand shock where the rich seem to be getting richer every day. The middle class and the poor are getting worse off. There is a report which is penned by the chief of the prime minister's advisors, Amrit Kumar, in which he says, the top, if you want to qualify into top 10% of India, all you have to do is to earn 25,000 rupees a month. Any family which earns more than 25,000 rupees a month is in the top 10% of India. The honest truth is that in a city where I live like Madras, anybody earning a family with 25,000 rupees income cannot survive without government support of ration and housing. We have landed ourselves in such a mess. The COVID money has exacerbated the problems in our economy. So I expect that rupee will continue to decline. Inflation will continue to increase over the next period of 18 months unless the Reserve Bank moves decisively to increase interest rates. If interest rates go up, automatically the economy will suffer. Crude does not affect only the price of petrol and diesel. Plastics, paints and other accessories, the basic input is crude. All FMCG companies, whether it is Hindustan Unilever, Britannia or ITC, have jacked up prices and will continue to increase prices. They have a called what is called as stinkflation. When the price of goods go, the price of Britannia, Tiger Britannia biscuits is same. But what they have done is reduced at the same price. You could buy 100 grams and today you are buying 80 grams. There is rising inflation and I don't see a complete recovery from this in the next two years. In fact, Shakti Das agrees with me. When the RBI put out a report, it said that to recover from the pandemic completely at current levels and current policies, it will take the year 2035. So the effect of the pandemic is going to be intergenerational. It is only when you people who are in your college today are at your mid-level career positions 10 years or 12 years from now is India will recover from the effects of this pandemic. Thank you for a chance to speak to this to you students in this August institutions.